It is Wednesday, September 28th, 2011. We have got a jam-packed InfoWars nightly news lined up for you this evening. The good, the bad, and the ugly in the collision between those that love liberty and those that love bondage and enslavement. The war is on, and it's a war on for your mind, your property, your children, your destiny, your currency. Coming up, historian and economist Webster Tarpley will be joining us on what's happening in Libya, the Middle East, Iran, and the economy. But first, let's get straight into the news. Wow. Our crew just got back, as you saw earlier in the week, from the big Denver martial law drill Mountain Guardian. And I wish I had crew to send them to this one, but we're looking at having Luke Radowski report for us tomorrow uh, and on Friday, so look for that here. But this D.C. to host simulated disaster exercise, they admit it's a drill to put people in the sports stadium, force inoculate them. Uh, they've got a, quote, mass casualty morgue exercise. This is some wild stuff that WTOP News Talk Radio and local television uh, is reporting on. So we'll continue to track that as it unfolds. And again, looks like Luke Radowski is going to be able to be in D.C. It kicked off today, but there's other drills coming up, so hopefully we'll have him pop in in the next few days to give us a breakdown of that. Now, speaking of forced inoculation, you'll remember earlier in the week we showed you clips of newscast uh, in California where they're going to people's doors and saying, it's the law, you got to take shots when there is no law. Well, now... Mike Adams, and he's going to be joining us tomorrow in studio of Natural News, has confirmed that the CDC is now calling U.S. households and demanding child immunization records as part of a vaccine surveillance and tracking program. So the feds are completely out of their jurisdiction and completely out of control, totally financed with big pharma. See, they had near 95% vaccine compliance in previous decades. Now it's totally swung, the pendulum. The vast majority, in some areas of California, it's above 70%, are not taking vaccines. And so now they're really trying to bully. They're really trying to intimidate uh, with this door-to-door -door forced inoculation and the feds calling you up and harassing you. Now, talking about the feds, we first learned three years ago, and it was in California, Alabama, and other major newspapers in major states, that the Marines, the Army, and others were showing up at checkpoints with guns and pulling citizens out of their cars. That violates posse comitatus, which is a federal law, and it's a felony act when they do that. But Kurt Nimmo wrote a report about this and linked to the Star Tribune a newspaper as well as uh, the Posse Comitatus Act itself. Wyoming program targets underage irresponsible drinking and they see this as a way to psychologically get the public to accept military on the street like we're Mexico or North Korea or something, uh, or China for that matter, or Russia. So it's like, oh, yeah, the Marines and Army are out, and they're going to search your car, not on a base, but on the side of the highway, because we're looking for underage drinkers. This is just an excuse to further acclimate the public, and, and, and it's just incredible, incredible uh, information. Now, speaking of the police state, we made a big deal out of this a couple months ago. In fact, we broke the news on air, and people couldn't believe it until national news went and checked it, and it was confirmed. I talked to multiple Texas gun dealers who were visited by the ATF and given letters, and we published the letters, that outside of law, they couldn't get this passed as a law this year, so they just had the ATF come and say, when you sell multiple rifles, Go ahead and report it to the ATF. Well, it's already reported to Nix and the FBI with the phone call to make sure you're not a criminal. So it was just mainly about people complying outside of law. And that was my prediction. Now, look at this document cam shot. U.S. Department of Justice, and this is confirmed, uh, the normal website that's for the national legalization of uh, marijuana laws uh, reporting on it. And, and here's the ATF letterhead down here. And we've made calls that confirmed this. They are now telling gun dealers, somebody comes in, gives them their driver's license, they call the FBI, they do the instant check, but they're not a felon. Does it matter? 
they have to ask them if they're a medical marijuana person under legal state laws. And this letter says, we don't care what the state laws are. Read it. It's up on Infowars.com right now. Kurt Nimmo's written an article about this. They say, we don't care if you're a marijuana, uh, medical marijuana patient, like my grandfather who was dying of cancer. And, um, you know, his buddy, the sheriff, even came by and said, here's some marijuana I confiscated. Smoke this. It'll make you be able to eat. And my grandfather, Jerry Jones, and he said, no, I'm just going to go ahead and die. The point is, it does help people hold food down. It's got treatments for glaucoma. Uh, it is a miracle herb like garlic or aloe vera. I mean, it's got hundreds and hundreds of uses. And the majority of states have passed laws saying, for medical reasons, it's fine to use it. And this is so incredible that outside of law, the feds are coming in and saying, even if you sell a gun to somebody and don't know they're a medical marijuana user and have a medical marijuana state law card, we're going to prosecute the gun dealer, the gun shop, and we're going to prosecute the marijuana, medical marijuana user. I mean, this is incredible tyranny. Every time I think I can't be shocked by a new level of oppression and corruption, government just takes it to a new level. I, in fact, I meant to cover this tonight. Make me cover it tomorrow, dude. It was in my stack. I didn't get to it. A judge has ruled that you're not allowed to have your own garden. A judge has ruled that because people sued saying I'm allowed to have a garden I'm allowed to do this and the judge said you under the police power have no right to grow a garden it is not a right to grow your own food and, I mean that's what I mean I'm so overwhelmed right now that I'm just moving from point to point in fact Rob it was on Infowars today and I actually had it in my stack in fact it the problem is they clean my broadcast desk off and pile it up every day Make me tomorrow cover that uh, issue with Mike Adams when he's on, okay? Because, because I mean, that's what I'm saying. I can't even cover it all here. That's what's frustrating. I can't spend an hour and a half or two hours like I would 10 years ago on the ATF saying, well, we don't need any stinking laws. And it says right here, we don't care if your states have passed laws saying you can have medical marijuana. They actually say... If you sell a gun to somebody that uses medical marijuana, we're going to imprison you. This is so out of control. Meanwhile, the federal government's on record letting the Sinaloa drug cartel that runs the U.S.-Mexican border ship in tens of tons a month for five years of cocaine and the ATF shipping them firearms, 2,000 at a time, to kill drug cartels that don't want their money through U.S. government. They just want to harass poor cancer patients and people that are smoking marijuana and harass American citizens. And I, for one, am sick and damn tired of the treason of the ATF and the stinking federal government. But at the end of the day, it's our fault for acting like cattle and putting up with this crap. I don't even smoke marijuana. And I understand the incredible medical uses for it, and it's an excuse to target the general public. Legalize it now and get the feds the hell out of our lives. It's on record, George Washington smoked marijuana, and the, his doctor's prescriptions from the apothecary, he grew it, but the, but the prescription where the doctor says, you need to smoke it for your stomach aches and your toothaches. They would arrest George Washington today in this country. I want this country to be land of the free, home of the brave, and not land of the cowards and home of the slaves. I'm sick of it. Okay, I'm done ranting. Look at this headline, feds to legal marijuana Feds to legal medical marijuana patients. You don't have Second Amendment rights, period. Unbelievable information. And a judge, a high-powered state judge rules, you can't grow a damn garden. You don't have any rights. I mean, I'm sorry. This is it's like the Bob Dylan song. Pretty soon, having your own garden will be against the law. Yeah, I'm going to grow corn on the moon and eat it raw. I mean, what is going on here? What's happened to my, my republic, your republic? Now, I want to shift gears here to a news package that the crew has put together because I saw this uh, report yesterday. Well, I saw it at prisonplanet.com. Uh, Paul Watson wrote it. It was up on the Drudge Report yesterday, red linked. AP labeled racist for accurately transcribing Obama's speech. And look, I don't care what your accent is. I don't care what color you are. As long as you're bona fide, as long as you're legitimate, as long as you're a real McCoy, I'm into people that are authentic. 
And every time Obama gets up in front of a black audience, if he gets up in front of a white audience, he talks like Urkel. Um, yes, um, good to be here with you today. And, uh, and reads off a teleprompter. But as soon as he's in front of a black audience, he's like, it's good to be here with you tonight, you know, OGs. And that's basically uh, what's happening. And, and you know, I've, I've had this with friends before, where, where you go to a Mexican food restaurant, and the person brings you over your food, and they're like, that is good. Would, I would like a taco now. And the person just looks at you like, what the hell, man? That'd be like if I went to New York City and was like, hey, my name is Luigi. How you doing today? Or people that come down from New York and are like, how you doing there, boy? There's nothing more phony and poser and ridiculous. And I, for one, am tired of politicians talking down to us. So we've only compiled three examples. There are many others. But the worst is Hillary Clinton. When she goes to a foreign country, she'll adopt some weird accent that isn't even from the country. Or when she goes to talk in Kentucky, she'll get into a redneck accent that's beyond anything I've ever seen. Like, how are you doing there, boy? This is an episode of Hee Haw. I mean, it is insane. I mean, I've got people here in my office from Venezuela. I don't walk up to them and say, would you like some coffee? Uh, again, it is an example of how the system condescends to you. They just look at you, have a stereotype, and go after it. And we got Obama kind of doing a little bit of a black preacher voice that isn't his own. And we got Rick Perry. And this isn't even the best clip. I've seen the full speech where when he's not just speaking Spanish, he's just talking. He, he literally is putting on this this fake accent. So it is entertaining, but in the final equation, it's very, very upsetting because it shows these politicians think we want something fake. In my experience, people just want something real. And it's insulting to act like uh, you're from somebody's area or part of somebody's religion or group if you're not. But it's all these CIA sociologists and anthropologists are admittedly the ones telling them how to act like this. And it's a major blind spot in the establishment. So let's go ahead and go to these clips. I'm going to press on. I expect all of you to march with me and press on. Put on your marching shoes. Shake it off. Stop complaining. Stop grumbling. Stop crying. We are going to press on. We've got work to do. See Hit pause. We're going to press on. I mean, can you imagine me as a white guy, I've gotten from a black guy, I was like, I'm Alex Jones, good to be here with you, I'm rolling with the OG. I mean, that would be insulting. Obama, who normally speaks in kind of a colloquial, you know, Eastern elite white pedigree of voice, almost like an Atlantic accent, when he gets in front of black folks, he does that thing. And so AP actually transcribes it properly with him cutting off the G's in his manipulative speech, and then they're called racist. But later, like we covered last night, dressing up in an ice cream cone is now racist. Let's go back to the next clip. See, God bless you. Buenos dias, Los Angeles. Que tal? It is good to be in California with so many friends. Head pause again. Hold on, back it up. It is good to be... Uh, be like if I had a, and I do, I, you know, great guy, he's an immigrant but here legally from China working for me. It'd be like if I walked up to him and said, uh, how are you doing? Would you like rice? Oh, you could do, oh, dang, 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 dang. I mean, this shows, this shows how incredibly manipulative they are. Whether it's Obama or Perry or Hillary, it isn't about racism. It's about manipulativeness and being inauthentic. I mean, who would even think, believe me, if you wanted to turn that black crowd on or a Hispanic crowd or a hillbilly crowd on, they'd like it if you just came in and talked to them straight, like you really are. That's actually cooler because it's, it's sexy, it's different. But no, these politicians are such chameleons that they think acting like a clown, I mean, I couldn't imagine being in that audience, in fact, there was a backlash against it, with Rick Perry from Texas getting up with some made-up Hispanic thing going, Los Angeles, good to be with you. My cousin Slobo Gonzalez will, you know, oh, Speedy will soon be here. Oh, yeah. I mean, it is, it is, it is, it's funny in comedy, if it was the Three Amigos or something, but this isn't comedy, this is Rick Perry. Now, let's get, let's get to the real, let's get to the real 
winner of this contest, Hillary. And there's a bunch of these clips. Whenever she's in the South, or especially Kentucky, it's like, yee-haw, Randall Banger. I mean, you can't even understand it. You talk about condescending, here it is. I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far. I don't believe he brought me this far. Now we've got some other clips. What's the next clip you've got? Oh, yeah, we covered this yesterday, but... Again, the hysteria over racism. You kill a million Iraqis, that's liberal and cool. Uh, or you put al-Qaeda in Libya to, and they kill 30,000 black people, that's liberal and good. But they've got everybody so paranoid now, including white yuppies, that they were driving along and saw this Puerto Rican immigrant wearing an ice cream cone outfit with sprinkles on it and went into convulsions of fear that it was a Klansman on the side of the road. And it all just dovetails with this. And you've got the bake sale at UC Berkeley coming up where it's true. If you're white, uh, you know, it basically averages out with the tuition, $2 per cookie, Asian $1.50, Latino $1, black 75 cents, Native American 25 cents, women get 25 cents off, period. And they're calling the young conservatives racist for illustrating this when they're illustrating it. But, but that's coming up. Let's just go ahead and go to this next clip. Decided it'd be the perfect way to attract business. Instead of an ice cream cone mascot with sprinkles on top, many passerbyers thought they saw a KKK <laughs> man. But it was no Klansman at all. Just a guy dressed as a vanilla ice cream waffle cone. Just don't know how this has anything to do with that. <laughs> but it's. <sighs> We're going to go to the next piece. This is all about getting us. See, you, you never think about economic discrimination. General Electric was the only company given waivers from new greenhouse gas emissions. And they own a lot of the power plants in this country. All their competition has to pay new taxes and pass the bills on to you or be shut down. What about economic discrimination? Uh, what about the fact that major Fortune 100 companies are almost totally exempt from taxes, but you and I aren't. No, 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 no. We're too busy running around seeing people in ice cream outfits. I've seen in Austin and almost running off the road, they reported in fear. We're too busy obsessing over supposed slights that are going on to miss every, all the real stuff that's happening, the real economic discrimination going on by offshore corporations. Now, in closing in this whole piece, Here's an ABC News article, a video, I, I have the article right here, where they're illustrating that in California, the bill is on the governor's desk, just like a forced inoculation bill is on his desk, where they actually codify, not affirmative action, not like a private university says, well, Native Americans have been really scammed. We want to try to encourage and give them scholarships or let them, I'm all for that. You know, let, let's try to, you know, even, even a quota, you know, hey, you know, let's try to have the university where people that haven't had a chance get. No, we're not talking about that. This is actually where, if you're white, you pay double, no more than double what a black person pays. Look, that is discrimination. Period. And and two wrongs don't make a right. And I'll, and and again, it isn't that you just pay double. They're making you pay double to pay for somebody else's tuition. And hey. If you looked at the statistics, women are 61% of college graduates now, and most of them aren't white. Don't worry. You drive around all day and see homeless white people everywhere. The average white person doesn't know their head from a hole in the ground. This idea that white people are like some master group screwing everybody is a fraud. Let me tell you, screwing people. It's the banks that are using their system to implode our society. But I'm done preaching. Let's just go ahead and go to this final clip. It's really there to cause people to think more critically about what this kind of policy would do in university admissions. Lewis says it's the club's way of taking a stand against pending legislation that would let UC consider a student's race or national origin during the admissions process. They've scheduled a bake sale where the price you pay for a cookie or brownie depends on your gender and the color of your skin. It's two dollars for white people, a dollar fifty if you're Asian, a buck for Latinos, seventy-five cents for African Americans, and a quarter for Native Americans. That's exactly the message the campus Democrats took away. The way that they made the statement, the words that they used, the fact that they humorized and mocked um, 
the struggles of people of color on this campus is very disgusting to me. Many other students were equally disgusted. It's wrong to try to make a statement about something that's serious by using something. I mean, I don't know what to tell this woman. What is it, like 80% of NFL players are black now? I mean, what, we're going to make it all white guys because you want to make it fair? I mean, I mean, it, it, it just what do they not get about this? They don't care about a million dead brown Iraqis, though. No, no, it's all, and, and oh, they're, 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 they're making a joke out of a serious issue. No, they're illustrating that they now have a bill on the governor's desk that actually says... Whites pay more than anybody else for tuition. I mean, that's incredible. I'm all for laws where you can't discriminate against a group or a religion. But when it turns into white people are going to pay more for something, where the hell does this end? And then those guys try to make an illustration of it, and they're called the racist. I tell you. You liberals aren't liberal at all. You are nothing but a political group of criminals. And the Republicans are a bunch of warmongers as well. You all ought to be happy with each other. Republicans ought to love Obama, all the wars he's launched. I just can't believe this country's turned into this. I mean, the, the, people that are on medical marijuana under state law and have a doctor's letter can't have a gun now. Outside of law, the ATF just says. And then meanwhile, you're, you're talking about people's rights to get ha half off or more on their tuition. What about all of our rights? Then I'll have the TSA grab our genitals and molest our wives. See, while you're busy obsessing over your religion or your color, all of us are getting screwed. Don't you understand that? If we all don't have the same rights, none of us have those rights. Jesus, what the hell's your problem? All right, I'm sorry. People ask why I get more wound up on this nighttime show. One thing, I'm burnt out and tired, and I'm sick of it. All day I'm reading this stuff. You know, by the time I get on the radio every day, I've been up since 6 a.m., but I'm still kind of asleep. By the time I get on air, it's like, when does this end? When does it stop? When does the ignorance end? Two wrongs don't make a right. It's really simple. It's like I've seen people before, they go, well, I got robbed by a criminal, so I decided to be a criminal. What, and rob somebody else? The one thing, if you went after the criminal, but don't just like, well, I got screwed, so I'll screw other people. You know, it's this, it's, it's this mindset. Okay. You know what, let's just go to break and I'll come back with the geoengineering and the diebold machines and the California prosecutor and all the rest of it. My God. It is the second segment and final segment of InfoWars Nightly News. If you're not a PrisonPlanet.tv subscriber and you're watching this somewhere elsewhere, please spread the word about the show and alternative media and please become a PrisonPlanet.tv subscriber if you resonate with this out-of-the-box true freedom message. Okay, I'm going to move fast now because i got to get to Webster Tarpley. Uh, geoengineering goes under the microscope in Australia, one of their major states, and more and more of their scientists are pointing out there are secretive and now public geoengineering programs going on that governments claim are to protect us from this and that, but the whole thing uh, is super creepy, so we're going to be uh, looking at that. Uh, it's also come out that Diebold, and we'll go to that slide here in a moment, Diebold voting machines can be hacked by remote control. This has been proven for a decade, but... Now they're being hacked with $10 pieces of equipment. And again, that's about all of us more and more losing our rights, but not being able to admit that we're being defrauded. But then it gets worse. First they said it was a joke, but now it's been confirmed that it was not a joke. She seriously told the media, the North Carolina governor suggested suspending elections to spur economic solutions. She said because people will be removed from office, if they do things that aren't popular, suspend elections. That's what Governor Bev Perdue, a Democrat, said. And now they've already suspended the Congress, the General House, controlling spending bills. That's now done by a, a committee of 12 tyrants. So just an incredible, incredible time to be alive. Finally, I want to play a clip of our good friend, Judge Andrew Napolitano. He had the district attorney on, uh, the prosecutor in Orange County, California, you know, that's nearby where that homeless guy who did nothing got beaten to death by the cops, and the cops covered it up at first, but finally they've done the right thing, and they've, they've charged one cop with premeditated murder, the other with manslaughter. And the district attorney pointed out, if cops in the wrong are beating you to death, you have a right to defend yourself with lethal force. That's common sense, that's common law, and that's what 1776 is all about. What can an ordinary person do to resist unlawful violence when the violence is perpetrated by the police? 
Well, you know, to begin with, uh, we do have a, a, a United States constitutional um, right to be free from uh, uh, unlawful or unwarranted excessive force uh, under color of law. So that part doesn't vary from state to state. And I think that uh, citizens or everybody, not just citizens, but we all have a right to, uh, to self-defense. Wow. I mean, I shouldn't say wow, but more and more people are just speaking the obvious, speaking the truth. We all got a right to defend ourselves. And it was on record, this homeless guy who's schizophrenic, his dad, by the way, was a retired cop, was just like, hey, man. Uh, and they just beat him to death. Reportedly, were like doing knee drops into his head for like 20 minutes. I mean, what, what the? I mean, what, what is? They're hiring a bunch of weenies who like to gang up five at a time on people. That's what it is. I mean, no respecting, self-respecting man wants to beat up people who didn't start a fight with you. I mean, it's almost shameful when a bully starts a fight and you break their jaw. Not that I've done that myself, but I've read about it. I mean, it, it, it is just so pathetic. And that's good. I hope they stick a needle on that cop's arm, and I hope they send him to hell. Because beating some guy to death who was begging for his mommy and his daddy, all on tape, doing nothing. I mean, there's nothing more cowardly than cops doing knee drops over and over. I'm killing a homeless person. I'm tough. What the hell is wrong with you? Well, you know what? You're going to get strapped down to a gurney because murder one is on your ass, premeditated murder, and, and you're going to see how it is. Okay, Cause, because we don't like weak people being targeted by the strong, by a bunch of wolves. And society is starting to wake up. Now, good cops, we support you. And if you defend yourself, that's great. We'll, we'll protect you under common law. But when you like to beat up and kill homeless people or shoot a black kid in handcuffs in the back and say that he was attacking you and that comes out, you don't deserve a year or two in jail like the San Francisco case. You deserve to go to prison. Or you deserve an eye for an eye, the killing you engaged in. All right, I'm out of time. I'm going to Tarpley here. Ahmed Dinajid, Dinajad. I keep getting, I have this new Freudian thing where I can't get it. It's Dinajid, Dinajad? Dinajid, yeah. I was Dinajad. Whatever, I'm having, uh, you know, five years ago I didn't know how to pronounce his name. I did perfectly and now I'm having problems. But Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda has now come out ridiculously and said, shut up. You know, we did 9 11, be quiet. With more on al Qaeda chastising the government of Iran for pointing out the obvious, the controlled demolition of Tower 1, 2, and 7, Webster Griffin Tarpley, doctor of, of course, history, and he's also an economist, joins us to break this down. And then the situation in Wall Street with the occupation there, uh, the world financial crisis deepening, the latest in Libya, and, of course, uh, new saber rattling with Iran. Dr. Tarpley, great to have you here with us. Thank you. Well, let's get into uh, what I was just covering. Uh, Ahmed Dinajid comes out and says, well, you know what he said. He said, I'm an engineer, and it looks like those are controlled demolition. And then al-Qaeda comes out and says, no, we did it with no proof of who even puts out this Aspire <laughs> magazine. I guess politics makes strange bedfellows. The speech by Ahmadinejad last week at the United Nations, I think, was probably the best of the entire session because he went through a whole part on the immiseration of the world, the poverty levels, the tremendous wealth disparities, wealth inequalities, how this is actually getting worse and not better. He talked about the dysfunctionality of the international institutions, how the United Nations doesn't work. It's dominated by a clique of rich imperialist countries uh, at, at the cost of uh, everybody else. And then also in the speech at the United Nations, he said, there's a basically a climate of neo-McCarthyism in the Western world, where if you bring up objections to the official story of 9-11, you're going to be threatened and intimidated. And he said the Iranian government had been threatened and intimidated when uh, a year or two ago he brought up the question of having an international commission on 9-11, which would be a great idea, and he should go ahead and do it and don't mind the, the intimidation. So uh, this is now continuation. Uh, this, the Al-Qaeda, I guess they're going to take the, um, the uh, Arlen Specter Award for the most imaginative defense of the official version so far, which is to say we're Al-Qaeda and that's not how we did it. This is absolutely ridiculous. We just have to remember what we've learned in Libya is that 
Al Qaeda is the CIA Arab Legion. It always has been. It always will be. And that's who's telling you these things. So that's the CIA speaking through Al Qaeda saying, no, it was not controlled demolition. It was uh, the official story. Well, Webster, routinely, you'll see an AP headline as if it's fact. Al Qaeda says you better pass carbon taxes. They actually said that last year, or we're going to attack you. So, so now even Al Qaeda supports Al Gore and uh, this new bankster tax. I mean, just just cartoonish, a uh, comic book, and it just continues on from there. But then you'll read in the bottom of the AP articles, it'll say this was posted on a message board and was unconfirmed. It should say unconfirmed message board. Al Qaeda says pay Al Gore money or unconfirmed message board or Inspire uh, magazine, which I know has Western intelligence links. You've got Amor al hanging out secretly at the Pentagon. You've got Adam Gadon, you know, hooked up with the ADL, coming out with all these videos. I mean, this is ridiculous. But as you said, I was going to go to Libya last. But now let's go to it first because you raise it. Now they're confirming, uh, ABC News is, thousands of heat-seeking shoulder launch missiles have fallen into al-Qaeda's hands in Libya. So U.S. forces have to go in. And of course, Gaddafi's still fighting on. We should point out recently you were actually uh, in Libya. And, 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 I mean, this is so predictable. First, they use al-Qaeda to start the, the attempted overthrow. They call them freedom fighters who are nonviolent. Then they put al-Qaeda in command of the cities they've got. The Qaddafi forces, the anti-al-Qaeda forces fight on. And now they're saying we've got to invade to get military force to knock out Qaddafi because al-Qaeda might get missiles. I mean, they're just counting on the American people not having any grasp of anything that's happening. Today we had the amazing spectacle of an Al-Qaeda spokesman from the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. This is the infamous Bel Hajj, alias Hassadi, alias Hasidi, uh, and, and a, a butcher who has left a trail of blood and corpses across the world from, from uh, Southeast Asia to the Indian subcontinent to the Middle East and many other places. So now this Bel Hajj, an Al Qaeda butcher and killer who's got the blood of American troops on his hands. Not only did he kill them himself, but he sent fighters into Afghanistan and Iraq to kill the GIs and also other NATO forces. And he brags about it. This is, this is undisputed. Not only does he brag, but he wants to be a victim. See, in, in the modern politically correct world, you've got to be a victim. So he's also a victim because he was tortured by the CIA after they caught him. His right-hand man is Gumu. That's bin Laden's chauffeur who spent six years in Guantanamo Bay concentration camp. So this is a guy who is now interviewed as a responsible spokesman for the Libyan revolution in the pages of the London Guardian. So and by the way, you were the first person I heard like eight years ago when they first opened up Guantanamo saying that it was really a sheep dipping operation where people supposedly disappeared into it to give them street cred with, you know, Muslim fighters or whatever, jihadis, but really they'd already been sent off to other areas to be trained. Now that's admitted. Uh, that really, it's sure. just a cutout that the real black sites and ghost sites are in other parts of the world with the real tortures going on. I mean, how transparent does this get? And now we've got to, A, give up our rights because the thousands of missiles are in the jihadis' hands, and B, they're saying drones are being deployed to Libya to fight al-Qaeda all over Africa. Afrikan now comes in. Exactly what you said, word for word, uh, in the Obama deception, now almost three years ago, we even show graphics, as you speak, of U.S. troops in NATO invading Libya. Well, Gaddafi is in the field and fighting. He's full of defiance. He makes statements through uh, Syria. There's a television station in Syria that broadcasts these statements. Musa Ibrahim, the information minister, is in the field and fighting. Uh, uh, Saeed al-Islam is, is in the field and fighting. And the other son, Kamis, is there. Daughter Aisha is making statements from, um, I guess, from Algeria, where she has taken refuge. So the Gaddafi command structure is pretty much intact. The rebels are militarily impotent. You can see that these people, they're good at butchering women and children, but they're no good at going up against Gaddafi's veterans. Now, so wait a minute. Don't, they're not, listen, they are good at butchering blacks. You were also one of the first to say, because you traveled over there, that they were six months ago exterminating blacks uh, in the right, east right. when they took control. But isn't that a politically correct sacrament that they're exterminating blacks on site? 
Well, they, they are, and but right now they, they're trying to take the city of Sirte. They've failed. This has been going on now for about a month. Uh, remember, the, the big NATO attack on Tripoli was the 22nd of August, and now it's almost it's almost October. They can't take Sirte. They can't take Bani Walid. They can't take uh, uh, Saba down in the desert. And then there's this whole area of Fezzan and the, the south and, and uh, related parts of Libya where the, where the rebels uh, basically have no political control whatsoever. So this is shaping up as a, as a civil war. Uh, the bottom line lesson, though, is strangely enough, if you're from al-Qaeda and you're in Pakistan, then the U.S. wants to kill you. They want to blow up your wedding party with a predator drone. But if you're al-Qaeda in Libya, then you're going to get billions of dollars from the, from the State Department, to all the seized assets, the most modern weapons. Hillary Clinton is going to come and coquette with you. And, and God knows what else. And, and it comes out that Tony Blair support. is in six secret meetings in the last few years uh, with Gaddafi doing business deals. Obviously, this is also about stealing the billions of uh, Libyan money that he invested trying to right. come in out of the cold. But but we've got to move on to other issues here, Webster. And you really are a resident expert on Libya because you were there during the bombardment. But but let's move on to the end game because I said this at the time. I said, OK, if I'm thinking like a globalist, like one of these Anglo-American New World Order guys, you, you use al-Qaeda, just disdaining the Western public. You use al-Qaeda to overthrow, to get in control. There's still rebel forces now uh, you know, that will fight back against that uh, takeover by the West with their jihadi front men out of Saudi Arabia and other areas. Then you start exporting terror out of Libya to Europe and the United States, using that to take liberties and freedoms, and, and, and just... Just use the media to ignore the fact that you put them in power. But I expected that it would take a year or two that they would at least think that people would have a uh, memory so they would wait some. They're not even waiting. They're already saying, give your rights up, checkpoints everywhere, Al-Qaeda took Libya. And then that's an excuse to bring troops and NATO into Libya to fight the people they, quote, put in, but they don't actually even fight them. It's just like this mock fake chess piece they put on the board and say, we can invade anywhere we say. I mean, I know I'm ranting. It's just so absurd. The, the Anglo-Americans, though, I think are in trouble on a number of, of fronts. Um, if the question of the Palestinian state comes before the United Nations Security Council, and if Obama vetoes it, that will basically put an end to this entire idiotic wave of color revolutions and CIA people power coups. The so-called Arab Spring will turn into the Arab winter in that moment. And... It's very likely that in a, as a result of that, Saudi Arabia will finally come to the parting of the ways with the United States, which is what Prince Turkey threatened in a very important op-ed in the Washington Post at the beginning of the summer. Speaking of See, Turkey, uh, not just Saudi Arabia, but not just Prince Turkey, Turkey, as you know, is moving away. And it was, well, Israel, again, yes. you two years ago, or three, said that Saudi Arabia was quietly trying to work with Russia and Pakistan. Now that's been confirmed. So, so those rifts are there. So... The, the Saudis are, are, I think, coming to the parting of the ways with the U.S. The color revolution, the destabilization of Syria using death squads and commandos from the Muslim Brotherhood, I think that's failing. I think the, the Syrian army has basically quelled them. And then you look at Pakistan. Notice the big date is the 6th of September. Don't forget that date. The 6th of September is when General Petraeus moved from the Pentagon to the CIA. And what happened then? Within two or three days, we had that alert. On the 9-11 weekend, there was credible evidence of terrorism. Oh, my God. And then Petraeus is the guy who delivered the threat to Pakistan. It was Petraeus who met with the head of the ISI last week and said, we're blaming you for the Haqqani network. We're blaming you for the attacks on the U.S. embassy and various assassinations in Kabul, Afghanistan. I think you're getting uh, an increased push towards aggression as well as towards totalitarianism on the home front. And it's got General Petraeus's name on it. And let me just take this a little further. You look at the question of the Republican primaries. Uh, the, the constant drumbeat from the media is that no Republican candidate can win the election. That's we right. Biden. We need a savior. There's got to be a somebody. Savior. Where is the man on the white horse? You know, please, Governor Christie. Does Jabba yeah. save us? <laughs> we had Bachman. So Bachman has a boom and then a bust. Uh, Perry has a boom and then a bust. Uh, if it's Christie, he'll have a boom and a bust. 
What's the choreography behind all that? I think it plays into the hands of Petraeus. Somebody I agree, who, and I've had, I've had insiders trying to influence me to support Petraeus. We quietly a few months ago talked on air about this, and so definitely the system is finagling uh, to, to test the waters for fainting Petraeus. And this, yes, exactly. Uh, it, like Julius Caesar, he seems to have the, the falling sickness, right? If you look in, uh, look in Shakespeare. But with, with Petraeus, it's that somehow he's lurking in the background. He's not going to go and slog through the snows of New Hampshire. He's not going to go glad handing people at, uh, you know, rotary meetings in Iowa. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to come in as the man on horseback, uniting the Pentagon and the CIA, using the Republican Party, but... Uh, but really floating above it because... And we uh, notice the, the social engineers always repeat the same plays. This is just like uh, the Bushes and Brown Brother Harriman and others coming to Smedley Butler, the two-time Congressional Medal of Honor winner, uh, the guy that's set to be the Marine Corps Commandant, and saying, we want to make you dictator. Uh, you know, We'll run you in a sham election. We want you to lead 500,000 men. And he wasn't a fascist, but he played along with it long enough to expose them. And that's all part of history. And the, and the McCormick Dickstein Committee, as you know, brought all that out, Dr. Tarpley. Uh, and, 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 and I do see a replay of this. And then all this fake right wing talk on Fox and stuff about, ooh, there might be a military coup. I'm seeing that floated. They'll fix this Obama. Uh, so very, very dangerous situation we see. And folks, don't think this won't happen. When countries and the world especially go into depressions, the move by the oligarchs, the finance oligarchs, is always to try to put strong military men in control. Uh, Webster, as a doctor of history, briefly explain why that's the case. Well, if you look at the 1930s, we have this, this pattern, right? It goes from world economic depression from 1929 to 1933. Then you get, in 1933, the Hitler regime, which is only one of a whole series of fascist governments. It started in Italy in 1922. The crisis hit them first. Uh, but as you go on later, basically most of the governments in continental Europe, especially Eastern continental Europe, become fascist in some way or other, be it Romania or Hungary or Poland or, or whatever it is. Um, that's the first step, right? So depression comes first, then a dictatorship, right? As emergency rule, we have all kinds of pressure towards Bonapartism. There's some, some governor today says she wants to call off congressional elections for a couple of uh, terms. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the North Carolina governor, and it's been confirmed. Yeah. The audio's Crazy. been released, and the newspaper's confirmed. She was serious. She yeah, said, let's suspend elections. Obama's talked about how great it would be if it could be his way. And we already have this super Congress where 12 uh, men and women create the spending bills. That's unconstitutional. The president has this veto, a council of 13. Europe's moving towards a, quote, economic union in their crisis. The whole move is towards dictatorial undemocratic systems. Again, I, I would call it Bonapartism because fascism is, is still a step beyond because fascism implies a, a real mass movement. But you look at Petraeus, that's, that's Bonapartism uh, for the United States. The 12 tyrants, as you say, the super committee or super Congress, the 12 tyrants, they're uh, uh, churning away in the background planning to destroy your economic security, take away your economic rights, strip you, flay you, all in the name of bigger and better bailouts for Wall Street. So Soros gets his money, Felix Rohatton gets his money, the Koch brothers get theirs, and, and so on down the line. Uh, just in terms of the protest against this, uh, there is this Occupy Wall Street protest, and maybe that's worth a word or two. If you look at this, there are a lot of people there who are very well-meaning and who would be indispensable for uh, profound social change. The problem is, this looks like a leaderless group, but it's not a leaderless group. You look at there's a structure underneath it. And this, unfortunately, comes from the Service Employees International Union. It comes from ACORN. It comes from basically the orbit around the Soros group of foundations. Uh, and this is a counterinsurgency operation. The one thing you notice about the Occupy Wall Street, they have no demands. There's not one specific thing that they demand. They don't ask for anything. Rather, they're focused on their process, right? Their democratic assembly. No, no. It's like Red Adair so using dynamite to blow out a oil well that's on fire. They just want to dissipate it, set the precedent. And yeah. it's been proven Soros is involved. Other more libertarian groups have shown up. But 
really all they do is they have Warren Buffett and Soros calling for a middle class tax increase that they say is on the rich. They're actually offshore and exempt. They just want new taxes on the middle class to pay themselves in a new austerity uh, bailout. So, so that's what I see is this is a Soros branding of a movement to, to, to try to take control of the leadership of any movement that's going to expose Wall Street for the derivatives or all of their derivatives uh, bailout corporate welfare. There's no discussion of corporate welfare. It's all raise taxes. But there, there's no no demands. They, they don't they don't raise any demands or demands like abolish capitalism or freedom now or stuff like this. I propose some demands for them. If you look at these people who are actually at this demonstration, the big problem they all have is student loans. Right now. The younger people in the United States are groaning. They're getting crushed under $1 trillion of high interest student loans. And this essentially is, it means that an entire generation of Americans is going to be wiped out. They can't create families. They can't uh, get married. They can't buy homes. Their credit rating is shot because they come out of college with 50, 75, $100,000 of, of student loans. The most obvious demand to make is an amnesty on student loans, cancel those loans. When you have Greece, right? They say Greece can't pay. Exactly, they can't pay. The bankers will have to take a haircut. Yes, a So haircut. it's time to default on those. It's exactly. Don't, don't default, but just cancel them. Well, like let me Carter's ask you this question. Let me ask you this question then. What is the point then of the Sorosian groups undoubtedly orchestrating this? And again, I'm not saying everybody there. It's, it's a diverse group, but Overall, certainly the media is giving voice to the people there, and they're not really, I mean, I've been watching them. The, their main demand is tax tax middle-class people and pay it, pay it to Warren Buffett and George Soros and bailouts. Yeah, they, again, I, if, if that, because generally it's this crazy No, I've stuff been watching like, it, Webster. That, that's what they're saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I look too. Uh, look, watch the mainstream media. It's George Soros every day saying, I'm exempt from taxes. Raise my taxes. Well, he's exempt because he helped write the loopholes to be offshore. I'm all right. for getting rid of that. The point is, the, the plan they push is an Obama tax increase, which we yeah, all know you put taxes on right now, the general public, it'll stall the economy further. The, the, the question is, the, the goal of Soros and his panoply of, of foundations and other operations is to make that Wall the, uh, the Occupy Wall Street into the left wing of re-elect Obama. Because if you come in there with these generic, uh, vague demands, abolish capitalism, uh, establish justice, freedom now, then Obama can say, yeah, of course, that's, that's exactly what and I'll And by the way, you. they are saying that. That then, that then uh, basically, uh, really in my view, discredits an anti-corrupt Wall Street movement by making it communistic in the general public's eye. That's like in the 60s, they'd have FBI operatives dress up like hippies and break out windows and spit on troops. For these people, I would propose a couple of tests. Are you in favor of the war in Libya or are you against it? Because if you're in favor of the Libyan war, you're an agent. The other thing is cancel the student loan debt, amnesty. Carter had an amnesty for people left over from, uh, from Vietnam, right? You were draft resistor in the Vietnam era. Carter gave you an amnesty. Great. Obama, give an amnesty to these students on their Yeah, because there are no debt. jobs for them to come to, and they know this. And the college education is a complete fr fraud now for how much it cost. In terms of taxes, the obvious tax is the Wall Street sales tax, the Tobin tax, a 1% tax on all Wall Street But turnover. instead, Wall Street has Herman Cain and all their other whores promoting a general new VAT or sales tax on us to pay them the money in bailouts. It, it's a disaster. The value-added tax is an absolute disaster. These are regressive taxes. We don't need them. We need progressive taxes. But more than anything, more than taxes on any individual, tax Wall Street banks and financial institutions, because that's what is not taxed. Others can argue that they're taxed. Yeah, that's the group that has a free hand to wreck the entire society. So, so listen, Webster, we're, we're running out of time here. I've got to talk to you about the world, the overall world financial crisis. That's where you're the real expert at. And then dovetail that with what is the leader of Iran, Ahmadinejad, what is he doing uh, having the head of their Navy come out and say, we're going to put ships off the U.S. Sure, I get the tit for tat. There's U.S. and European ships all around them and right up in their face, in their grill, as uh, the trendies would say today. But, but still, Iran has done well to not be provocative. 
Why would they want to give an entree uh, into conflict? Well, the great principle of international relations, of course, is reciprocity. And whatever you insist on doing to somebody else, eventually somebody else will do to you. So I, I would not recommend gestures of this kind. But on the other hand, you have to think about his domestic political audience and uh, the idea to maybe knock uh, these elites in the West a little bit off balance. Uh, certainly, we see Chinese vessels now, warships in the Mediterranean, uh, a couple of Iranian uh, corvettes or frigates in the North Atlantic. Not going to make any military difference. It's largely symbolic, and I think largely for domestic consumption. So I don't, I don't think that's so outrageous. So it's Remember tough guy saber rattling because the Iranians are tired of the spy flights and the ships all around them. It's, it's their military acting tough. A, a little bit of chess beating. Yeah, I think today the announcement from Iran was that they've now got a cruise missile which has gone into mass production. So that's it's the, the other side of the coin is don't come into our nearby territorial waters or or you're going to have uh, trouble. But the, the, the big in, in, international crisis, of course, is we're now in the second wave of the Depression, right? 1929 was the first, 1931, the European banking crisis, the second, and then a U.S. banking panic in 1933 was the third. This time it's the Lehman Brothers crisis three years ago. That was the first wave. Now we're in the European banking panic. It's a banking panic. It's not a sovereign debt crisis or anything else. It's a crisis of the banks. And you can look at these banks, Sakgen, Kadi, uh, Agricole, Barclays Bank, Deutsche Bank, and, and all the rest of them. These are the, the fo focus of the, of the crisis. Uh, and what you have now is the, the inability of the European Commission, especially Barroso, the Portuguese uh, politician coming from a fascist uh, political background, the guy who gave the State of the European Union today. He wants euro bonds. It's crazy. You can't bail out derivatives. There are too many derivatives. The European share of derivatives is at least $500 trillion of bankrupt kited derivatives. Well, Webster, you've been, in closing, you've been talking about this for a decade. We're talking $1.5 quadrillion. And no matter how many bailouts there are in Europe, as you have rightfully said, it's never going to fix it. Now the IMF needs one. Uh, now they want this new, quote, economic union. And, and they openly say, get rid of what's left of European sovereignty. I've heard them on Bloomberg say the democracy of Germany is bad because they don't want to go along with it. I mean, they're so naked now. So, so where do you see this going? Well, until you change policies, the depression gets worse and worse. And of course, the, 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 the policies that would change something would be one of the things I said before, the Wall Street sales tax, the Tobin tax. There are people in Europe who want to have a Tobin tax, and that would be a good step, except you got to make sure the money goes to the national treasuries to maintain your social safety net. The other thing is you want to get a recovery. you got to attack the Federal Reserve, and here's how you do it. you got to force Bernanke, either by law or by leaning on him, by political pressure. Bernanke, you've been giving 0% credit to banks, to credit card companies, to everybody who's a financial speculator. In some case, some less than zero, Webster. Gets, yeah, 0% or, or less in terms of credit. What the Fed would have to do to get a recovery is announce that they're going to buy a trillion dollars of bonds from American states at a 0% coupon and a hundred year maturity. So exactly loan the fiat directly into the states and the people instead of right. the offshore uh, constellations that loan it back exactly. at 30% interest. Exactly. And, and this is now federal lending. We, we don't want to go. But what I don't further. like about the fake right wingers is they'll say corporate welfare, let the banks have 10 trillion in bailout or whatever, but then they'll sit there and talk about a welfare mom all day. You know, my issue is I don't want dependency. I want to get folks off welfare. I mean, I want them off of it. But the bigger issue is how does Rush Limbaugh and all these guys promote this giant corporate largesse? Well, they, they of course, get the, the news is they get paid for their views. In other words, the, the, not just the ads on those programs, but also the actual content of what they say is bought and paid for by various uh, reactionary interests. But the, the question with the Federal Reserve is it's got to be nationalized. There's a tremendous credit creating power that belongs to the American people, and we want it, and we want to use it. So start with a trillion, buy these 0% bonds from states, 100-year maturity, to build what? To rebuild the interstate highway system, to rebuild the entire rail system, passenger freight, and bridges, commuter. infrastructure that 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 the makes electrical uh, grid. Uh, instead, the globalist model. Canal. 
Instead, Webster, the globalist model is to slap toll roads on already taxpayer paid for existing roads and call it free market. That's not free market. It's robbery. Then you better, you better factor in the uh, expense of learning Chinese because that's who's going to be giving you orders. So you got to rebuild your infrastructure. Uh, and again, public buildings, schools, hospitals, absolutely. Uh, water projects, a huge question, especially in, in the arid areas of the West, right? So you wouldn't have such a drought in, uh, in Texas if you had adequate uh, irrigation facilities. So a trillion dollars, and that can go either to states or to something like, you know, the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey. Well, it has We're been these... proven that infrastructure projects do, it's one of the only government things that actually does something, creates a chain reaction in wealth in the areas it's built. Right. And this go, the contracts go to the private sector. In other words, the federal government, the Fed, the nationalized Fed, or partly nationalized anyway, nationalized enough to give out a trillion for these things. The money goes to the states. The states then make sure that it goes into infrastructure and only infrastructure. Those are capital goods. So that means you're increasing your capital goods stock and you're increasing the productivity of labor. And that's how you get a multiplier. You can't start with consumer spending. You got to start with. Yeah, I know. Buying more Chinese slave baubles isn't going to get us out of this mess. But Webster, here's my final point. Those that watch this and criticize you as a socialist or something, they don't understand it's a pure from your American pers American system. No, no, this no. Is this is American Manly system. But, but let me stop you. How can they then support 16, 25, whatever the numbers are different, trillion in banker bailouts that went nowhere? when infrastructure would actually go to the people in the building of it and then the use of it and then the maintaining of it. There's no debate. In closing, Vladimir Putin, before I even heard he got a facelift, boom, so you can see the facelift. He's coming back. Medvedev, his little minion, is, is agreeing with it. I always saw that as a fake ruse. Uh, you thought there was a split there. One minute on Vladimir Putin and what's happening in Russia. I think the, the fact that Putin is coming back as president is, is one of the best things that's happened all year. And not only do we get Putin again as a strong leader for Russia, we get Putin minus Kudrin. Because Putin, he was able to engineer this. He basically played Kudrin, the finance minister, against Medvedev. Kudrin thought that he was going to become the next prime minister, that Medvedev would be dumped completely. Now, Therefore, it's a masterpiece by, by Putin to play these one against the other and get rid of Kudrin. So now we are, in many ways, the best of all possible worlds, at least for the moment in Russia, that you have Putin and no Kudrin. You look at the American press, look at the Washington Post, look at the Wall Street Journal. They're apoplectic. They can't stand it. When the financier news. No, I know the New that, World they, Order doesn't like Putin. I'm still don't. creeped out by a Russian strongman. I mean, my only issue is. You know, why can't Russia ever have a real election, have a new leader? Or are you saying they want Putin for life? Uh, Putin is the most popular candidate. And was, uh, based on a democratic election, Putin is going gonna, is gonna to win it. The, the power of Medvedev was simply foreign support. The overwhelming support of the IMF, of the U.S., the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank. Europe. And did Putin let them put in Medvedev as kind of a scam to go ahead and get the foreign investment that's been double-crossed well, that? Part of it is this question of the Constitution, right, that you're not allowed to have more than two terms in a row. So Putin so thought, put a, put a weakling in for a few years and folks will wish for me again. Right. Uh, let's take an example. If we had had Putin in, in power this year, I don't think the Libyan war would have happened because Putin would have vetoed it. It was the weakness of Medvedev, as pointed out by Russian Ambassador Chamov to, to Libya. What Medvedev did was really a betrayal of Russian national interest by supporting this crazy attack on Libya. Medvedev even said, we'll send peacekeeping troops. This is absolutely crazy. You, can, you can't get anywhere by betraying your allies. So where does way. the effeminate Medvedev go now? Oh, he'll be he'll be prime minister, and well, he may be prime minister, um, and that's uh, you know that's maybe unavoidable. The one thing I was talking to a well-informed Russian uh, yesterday, and she said the um, danger now is the transition period between now, where it's clear what the plan is, and the actual election and inauguration. They're expecting attempts to destabilize the country. In other words, the U.S. and the British are going to say, my God, if Putin makes a comeback, we'll never have a color revolution. We can't do our CIA people power coup. Let's rev up the Chechens. Let's rev up some. So terrorism. they'll start having jihadis blow the hell out of Russia. 
Something like this, yes. All right, Webster, we got to leave so. it there. The other one is also just Serbia, right? Notice there's a big shooting incident today on the border uh, of Serbia and this Kosovo criminal enterprise. That's also, uh, a, that's the beginning of a destabilization. Well, you're Russia. being an extremist, not saying, the jihadis are great people. It's good that al-Qaeda has been given Libya. According to our media, and I support our mainstream media, Webster, it's I, very listen. evil that you're anti-al-Qaeda. Tarpley.net. Encourageable. Webster, thanks for talking to us. Thank you always, Alex. Well, it's clear. We are beta testing InfoWars Nightly News. It's going to end up being an hour long. I think it's just a stated fact that I love information. I love our guests. I love our crew. I love the fact that my crew always overproduces news packages and information. And so the show is always about an hour long. And so I'm going to leave it at that. Now, we'll see if tomorrow night I can do 30 minutes, but I'm sure we'll fail. And at the end of the day, I'm, I think you're happy. It's unscripted. It's teleprompter free. I'm Alex Jones signing off for InfoWars Nightly News. We got some big reports tomorrow and Friday. We couldn't do it without you. Subscribe to PrisonPlanet.tv or buy your friends and family memberships if you believe in the type of information, the real out-of-the-box thinking you're seeing here. I, for one, am proud to be associated with this operation and associated with you. We'll see you back tomorrow night, God willing.